So today I want to talk to you about serving, serving. About a few years ago, y'all have heard me, some of y'all heard me tell this story. And I won't get into the uh, details of the story, but a few years ago, me and my wife, uh, she was pregnant with our first child. Uh, and we lost Josiah. So losing him was one of the greatest tragedies of our life and our marriage. And, and in the midst of that tragedy, you feel pain. I remember the days seemed long and hard that you couldn't even get out of bed. And we, obviously, where I worked at, they gave me some time off, and, and we hadn't been to church in a little bit because of what we were going through. But when we finally returned, I remember walking through the door, and one of my friends greeted me at the door. And it was more than just him greeting. It was more than him just opening up the door. But when he met me there, he knew what we went through. And we had a lot of people reach out to us and, and through message and text. And it, that, that was great. And I appreciate the love and support of the community that we had. But it wasn't until that moment I wasn't able to just like pour out all the hurt, the pain, all the emotions, all the thoughts that I had. And I remember him looking at me and goes, are you okay? And like encouraged me to pull me to the side. It wasn't just about greeting me in, in the moment, say, good morning, Greg, how are you doing? I know what you went through, are you okay? And just left it out there. It wasn't, it wasn't that. I remember him seeing that I wasn't okay. And him pulling me to the side, and it's like, man, what's going on? I know you're carrying something. Let's, can you talk me through what have you been thinking? What have you been feeling? And, and in those moments, I was able to pour out all those thoughts, all those hurts, all that pain. And it's allowing my heart to start to heal again. See, him serving me was more than just opening up a door. But it was him serving me, ministering to me, was able to allow my heart to heal. It was because he was walking in compassion. And that's what we, I want to focus on in serving. And the, the word serving and, and, and this topic, we could talk about so many different things. And there's a lot of great things with this topic. But I want to lean into the why. Because sometimes we do things to be doing things, right? That you're greeted this morning because that's what you do on Sundays. You, you're, you're serving in kids' ministry because you were scheduled to serve in kids' ministry. But I want to remind us the why behind what we do. It's because we're called to walk in love. It's because that we're called to walk in compassion. And I know the word love in our culture, it twists this twist that word and it can mean all sorts of things and it's hard in a me-centric world to not twist things like love but when we're God-centered what does this word mean what's the reason behind what we do I believe that love is more than just an emotion it's more than a, a feeling it's more than butterflies that you have for somebody special there's so much more in that that love to me is something that compels you to action. If I had to define love, it's this. is that love says go. That love says go. That love calls us to action. And we see this. We're about to dive into the scripture. But we see this in Jesus' life and his ministry. That everything that he did was out of compassion. He died on the cross and rose from the grave because it was the greatest statement of love that human history has ever seen. When he ministered to the widow and the poor and the fatherless and the homeless, it was out of compassion because it was compelling him. It was compelling him. So this is what it says in Scripture. I love that we see that Jesus ministered and he served one with compassion. And we see in Luke, my computer's messing up. We see in Luke chapter 6, on another Sabbath, he returned and entered the synagogue and was teaching. And a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they, may, they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts, and he said to the man with the withered hand, Come and stand here. 
And he rose and stood there, and Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or destroy it? And after looking around at them, he said to him, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury, and they discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. What they might do to Jesus. I love that Jesus, despite what the religious community said, despite what they would think, despite what the order of their service was, he still chose compassion. Even if it was about one person, if even if it wasn't about hundreds and thousands that Jesus did for one, what he wished he could do for all. And there's so many of us that we get caught up in this trap that, well, I can't do a lot. But maybe God just wants you to minister to one. Maybe God just wants you to love on one. Maybe God's calling you to use your gifts and your talents to reach one. Maybe not thousands. But what happens when you have a thought process, if God's called me to serve one every week, I'm just looking for one person. I'm looking for one person that my heart is leaping out, that God is calling me to go, that love says go. If I'm just looking for one person a week, that's 52 a year. It's 104 in two years. And the next thing you know, you're starting to change hundreds and thousands of people throughout your life because you're just looking for one. And I love that Jesus is in the midst of these Pharisees, in the midst of their service, and they're, they're wondering, is, is he going to break our rule and heal on the Sabbath? And unfortunately, I, we see in churches, not even just in today's time, but even throughout history, where they get so focused on perfection, they get so uh, focused on what they look like and their image, and they get so focused on their structure and their order that they miss the one. They don't allow compassion to lead their service. They, they're, more, they're more structured than they are leading with their heart. They're, over, they're more about performance than they are about people. And I'm not against structure. I'm not against excellence. But when that rides over people, that's an issue. That's a problem. I love what one pastor says. He says that we should serve with the heart of a king. And rule with the heart of a servant. See, God wants us to walk in excellence. He wants us to walk in righteousness. He's not against structure. He's not against order. He's the one that made everything. And it's in perfect order. I'm not against that. I love, I'm, my wife probably, probably don't like it at times, but I love we're about to go on vacation. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go visit a church. And I'm going to ask them how they do, what they do, how, you know, so forth and so forth. Because that's what I find relaxing. I find relaxing. I find relaxing. I go on YouTube and I watch videos. What's the structure and government structure of the Presbyterian church? Or the Lutheran church? Or the Catholic church? Or, you know, I love structure. I'm not against it. But st structure should allow us to because that we want to serve with excellence. That we want to serve with the heart of the king. Because that's what it's about. That's the why behind structure. That's the why behind excellence. That is people over performance. It's people over performance. It ain't just about saying, saying the right thing when you hold the door. But it's about the person that you're holding the door for. It's about reaching that one. And Jesus saw that. Everywhere he went, he was looking for that one. Because his heart compelled him to action. And his love compelled him to action. Because love says, go. Then we also see that Jesus, he served the multitude with compassion. He served the multitude with compassion, not only the one. So I ain't against structure. I ain't against having a lot of people. I hope this church reaches thousands, not only in Lexington, but around the world. But if we're reaching thousands and we ain't making disciples, that's an issue. And the enemy of love is apathy. That's something to write down. See, the opposite of love is not anger. The opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is apathy. It's getting so used to what you're doing that you're kind of like nonchalant. You're just doing it. 
You don't have that zeal that you used to have. And so much about religious structures and that we see with these Pharisees and these religious leaders towards Jesus, they were more concerned about their rules than their heart. They were more concerned about the rules of the king than the heart of the king. They became apathetic. And being, and I ain't going to go down this rabbit hole, but being religious is not the issue. I know you see people preach against it, but relig, being religious just means to be devout. The question is, is what you, are you devout to? What are you devout to? Are you more concerned about hitting perfection than people? Or are you more concerned about your rules than the king who written the rules? Are you devout to him or you're devout to the rules? See, pure and pure religion is what? It's this. It's, the, it's ministering to the orphans and to the widows. It's serving one another. And it's because that you have this, you've encountered Jesus and you've encountered his heart. And you can't help for that to pour out into you and overflow into the community and to the ones around you. And you can't help to serve one another because love says go. And that's pure religion. That's being devout to him. And by being devout to him, you start to follow his commandments. If you really love him, you'll follow his commandments. If you really love him, you start to minister, start to serve one another. I know our culture don't say that. Our culture is about what we can build up. Our society is about what can I gain, not about what I can give. It's how I can be served. I'm going to get more money in my pocket so I can afford a cook, a driver, and I can be served everywhere I go. Don't have to cut my own grass. Don't have to take care of my house. And all of that sounds nice. I wish I had all that. But it's not about that. It's about serving one another. It's about serving one another. And Jesus not only served one, but he served the multitude with compassion. We see this in Matthew 15, 32. Now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they now have continued with me three days and have nothing to eat, and I do not want to send them away hungry lest they faint on their way. This is the story of the feeding of the 4,000. The little boy that gave Jesus his, his fish and bread, and Jesus was able to take the little and to feed the multitude. But I love that it says that Jesus felt compassion on the multitude. In the Greek, compassion just simply means this. It means to yearn from the bowels, to feel somebody's pain. It means it, it, it's, it calls you to action on somebody else's behalf. See, compassion calls you to action. It ain't just feeling this in your gut. It ain't just feeling this pain in, the, in your bowels. But it calls you to action. And we see this, this word over and over and over in Jesus' ministry. Him serving and ministering to one another. That he felt this compassion. That he felt this love says go in his life. No matter what you're going through in this room, Jesus knows your pain. He knows your hurt. He knows your heartache. And only does he know that, he, but he sympathizes with that. I could, it doesn't explicitly, explicitly say in Scripture, but this word, it almost gives the image that when Jesus was walking through the crowd and he saw the hurting and the broken, the people that need healing, the people that were hungry, the orphans, the widows, when he saw them, he felt this compassion. And I could just see him, he started to feel this in his bowels. I don't know about you, but have you ever, like, really cried? I'm not talking about watching. My, my son's been watching Toy Story 3 uh, a lot on repeat, all day long, every day. Um, I almost know every word. Uh, but at the end of Toy Story 3, I mean, talking about just, you know, s simple tears from Woody almost dying in the fire. He made it out, spool, spoiler alert. But, but I'm talking about really crying. Really cry. That, you're, that, you're, that your stomach, that your body starts to tremble. And I, I would say it's probably safe to say, probably about everybody's felt that. About one thing or another. 
And I could imagine Jesus as he walked through the crowd and, and he knew their hurts, their, he knew their needs and their pains. That, that compassion that he felt, that compassion that he yearned from his vows, that he start, I could imagine him start weeping through the crowds, weeping for the one, weeping for the multitude. See, even in the room filled with 100 plus people, God knows you. He knows your pain. He knows your purpose. He knows what you're going through. And when you cry, he knows that pain. He feels compassion for you. And it's something about that, when we operate out of compassion, that God starts to move. See, when we just move for the sake of us moving, God might not move. But when we operate out of this compassion, that we see God start to to move, that he only not only does he move for the one, but he moves for the multitude. It doesn't matter how big your gifting is. It doesn't matter how skillful that you think you are or how much you have to give. You could think it'd be little to nothing. You could be like that little boy. And all you have is a few loaves and fish. But if you start to line your heart, if you start to listen to that compassion, that love says go. If you start to line your heart with the rhythm of his heart, and you're willing to give over your gifts, if you're willing to give over what God has given you to steward, he could take the little and he could reach the multitudes. He can reach hundreds, he can reach thousands with what little that you have. And it's because we simply align up with his heart. Because when we start to operate out of compassion, God starts to move. That God starts to move. That I don't know about you, but there's times I remember I was going to save a lot to a grocery store. And I saw this young man, and I see I don't I didn't know him from Adam, never seen him before, don't know his name. But I remember when he came out and I just I just heard Holy Spirit speak to me in that moment about what he was going through. And God said, nobody's praying for him. When's the last time that you felt compassion to pray for somebody else's need? When is the last time that you felt compassion to pick up that phone and say, how are you doing? When is the last time that you felt compassion that you actually cried for somebody other than yourself? And that includes me. That I got to question myself. Am I being apathetic? Am I being me-centric? Am I being self-centered, or am I walking with the heart that God's called me to walk with? Am I reaching out to my friends that I know that are going through things, or am I just forgetting about it because I'm just focused on my task? See, God's called us to walk in His compassion for one another. He's called us to, to carry one another's burdens. That love says, Go. To serve with excellence, we, have, we must love. To serve with excellence, we must love. And I love what it says this in 1 Corinthians 13. Now this chapter gets used a lot at weddings, maybe a love letter, and so forth. And I don't think the Apostle Paul, when he wrote this, probably had that image. He wasn't talking about somebody's romantic feelings. But he was talking about the why behind somebody's gifts, their talents, their anointing, their spiritual gifts, and why the church operated. He wanted to make sure the why was staying with what God told them to have. That the motivation was the right motivation. That it wasn't self-centered, but it was God-centered. So it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, If I speak with tongues of man and of angels, but have not love... For others growing out of God's love for me, then I have became only a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Just an annoying distraction, it says in the Amplified. And if I have the gift of prophecy and speak a new message from God to people and understand all mysteries and possess all knowledge, and if I have all sufficient faith so that I can remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all of my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned but do not have love, it does me no good at all. Everything that we are called to do 
is to be out of this. Out of this compassion. Out of this love for one another and for God. That I love that it says that if you operate without love, that your gifts are just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. That you're nothing more than just an annoying distraction. I don't care if you're as talented as Peyton Whip and can play the drums up here like a madman. But if you're up here just to play drums to be seen, you're just a distraction. If you're just greeting because it's the thing that you're supposed to be doing, you're just being a distraction. If I'm just up here preaching just to be seen and be heard and get a pat on the back, I'm just nothing more than a distraction. We're called to walk out of compassion in everything that we do. That the reason behind that you play drums, it's because you want to minister to people. That you want God to minister to where they are. That you know that when you're at that door, it's more than just simply standing at the door and saying good morning. It's more than saying welcome home. But it's as people are walking in, they are hurting, they are broken, they are looking for hope, they're looking for love. They're walking in this place. Week after week, looking for answers, hoping somebody reaches out. I don't know how many times I hear from people that they're just trying to find community because they realize they can't do it alone. It's more than just greeting. It's more than just offering coffee. It's more than rocking a baby. It's more than just doing sound. It's more than just going on serve day and reaching out to our community but it's ministering to people. It's walking in the compassion that God has called us to. It's being compelled to his heart for people. They need you. And the scripture says that Christ in us is the hope of glory, that hope that they're looking for, that eternal question that they have about one day where they're going to be, that hope that they're looking for, that faith that they're looking for, that love that they can't find anybody anywhere else. It's here. The answer is here. Week after week, the gospel is the answer. It's more than just minister. It's more than just serving. It's about the one. It's about the one. What if you, when you open up that door and say good morning and the Holy Spirit quickens to you, go talk to that person. What if it changes the course of their life? What if that one conversation, not only does it, they become a disciple and a believer, but their whole family gets saved. And generation has changed in that household because you were willing to be bold enough. And I know sometimes that's hard. Trust me, I know it's hard to step out, especially if you're introverted. I get it. Sometimes going out and walking up to a new person and having a conversation. But guess what? It's not about us. It's not about us. That we're called to carry one another's burdens. That we're called to minister to one another. That God chose you for a reason. That many are called, but few are chosen. He chose you for a reason to be in that position. He chose you a reason to rock that baby. He chose you for a reason to be be in the parking lot because he's putting you in a position to minister to those people that are going to walk by you. He's filled you with that love. I remember my youth pastor, Jason Creek, when I was a teenager, he asked me to ride the bus with him. He was... He was taking some students home on a Wednesday night. And after we dropped off the last student and we were headed back to the church, and I can't remember, I was a young teenager, I don't know the exact age. But I remember him, and he would ask me this question often. What has, been, what has God been speaking to you? And I knew it was coming because it came often. And in my mind I was preparing for it, and I really knew what I was going to say. And, and I looked at him and I was like, broken. Because I didn't understand it. I knew what it was like to have family members and friends who didn't know Jesus. And I couldn't understand what, what was the hold up. What was keeping them back. And I said, Jason, I don't get why God chose me. Why did his love encounter me? I wasn't necessarily looking for him. But God found me in the middle of my mess. And I encounter his love, I encounter his presence, and it changed everything in my life. Why did I encounter his love? That 
we love him because he first loved us. Why won't he encounter them? Why won't he reach out to them? Where is he in those moments? Where is he in the middle of their mess? And that wondering, that pain I felt. It's that compassion that God is calling all of us to. And if I'm honest, years later, years into ministry, there's times I can forget the why. There's times I can get caught up in like, how do I be a better preacher then instead of how can I serve the one? There's times I can get caught up in what do I need to do this week and I forget the people because I'm more concerned about my task. There's times that I allow my faith to become apathetic and my heartbeat's not lining up with his, but my heartbeat's lining up with my selfish gain. See, we have to remind ourselves the why, that we have to remind ourselves that love says go, that it's not just about using our gifts and our talents and being this annoying, clanging symbol. I remember this one person at a church that we were at, he approached our pastor and he says, I want to serve, I want to serve, I want to serve, that God's called me to serve. He goes, great, I need somebody to clean the bathroom this week. He said, God didn't call me to that, God called me to preach. Yeah. It just shows you his heart in that moment. It wasn't about ministering. It wasn't about serving the one. It wasn't about reaching out in compassion, but it was about being seen. And we see that a lot, unfortunately, in churches. And I understand in the seasons of waiting, the people that have been called and have been gifted, and they're like, I wish I got to preach more. I wish I got to sing more. I wish I got to play more. I wish I got to do this more. And you can get impatient, and your heart gets focused on all the wrong things instead of what God has called you to. If you can't scrub the toilet, you might not be need, needing to preach. So it's not about being seen. And sometimes when God's called you to reach out to the ones, you might not ever hear a back about them. But it's not about getting the pat on the back. It's not about doing a good job. It's not about, oh, man, you changed my life. You might not ever see them again and God flipped their life upside down. But it's just simply about trusting him because you were obedient to his call. You're obedient to that compelling. You're obedient to that compassion. Because love says go. Again, in 1 Corinthians 13, it continues, that in love endures with patience and serenity. Love is kind and thoughtful. It is not jealous or envious. It does not brag. It is not proud. It is not arrogant. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not provoked. And it does not take into account a wrong endure. It does not rejoice at injustice, but rejoices with truth. Love, it bears all things regardless of what comes. It believes all things, looking for the best in each other. And it hopes all things. It remains steadfast. It don't become apathetic, but it remains steadfast even during difficult times. It endures all things without weakening. Love never fails. It never fails. It never ends. And I love that it says in, in these, these last few verses that it doesn't rejoice at injustice, but it bears all things. And it believes all things. It's about being there with one another. It's about being there to carry one, one another's pain. I love that when we see in Acts that the church supported one another. It wasn't about building up one household. It wasn't about building up one individual. But it was about walking through life together. Because they had compassion for one another. When's the last time that you, when's the last time that we have walked along somebody during their darkest hour and helped carry that burden? When's the last time that, that an individual faced an injustice that we rose up for them? When is the last time that a community has faced an injustice that the church has been there for them? That the world needs to see this compassion. The world needs to see this love. In a world that's filled with so much selfish gain. In a world that's filled with so much anti-love. That when you get on social media, that's not what you see. We see everything else that divides us. There was a study in 09 
And this has been, I mean, 09 is way back when. It feels like forever ago, man. I was 16, 17. Yeah. Um, but in 09, the study by the University of Michigan said that college students, that I don't know how they measure this, but, they, <laughs> but somehow they did. The University of Michigan said that college students, that compassion fell with them over the last 20 years by 40%. I wonder how much more in the digital age. That we're so easily angered, that we so easily get riled up by a post that we've not seen, or by, by somebody that we've not seen in 20 years, or somebody that we don't even know. And that when we see, we see, mo- we see so many bad things and so many pains and hurts on social media that we, our hearts become callous. And it's hard for us to feel that compassion. It's hard for us to feel that love that we can just sit there and scroll and scroll and scroll. And if anything, you might, outside of a funny cat video, laugh. You get angry because of what somebody put on Twitter. And it's hard in this age, and the world needs to see a church that's filled with compassion. The world needs you. The world needs what you have to offer what God has put in your life. The world needs to see love says go. These last few verses in 1 Corinthians. Love never fails, it never fades nor ends. But as for prophecy, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for special, for the gift of special knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part. For our knowledge is fragmented and incomplete. But then which is complete and perfect comes. And that which is incomplete and partial will pass away. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. And when I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now. In this time of imperfection, we see in a mirror dimly a blurred reflection, a riddle, an enigma. But then when the time of perfection comes, we see the reality, the face to face. And now I know in part, just in fragments, but I will know in fully, just as I've been fully known by God. And now there remain faith, which is abiding trust in God and his promises, hope, which is confident expectation of eternal salvation and love, unselfish love for others, growing out of, that comes out of God's love for me. And out of these three, three, the greatest of these is love. Is love. See, and I love that it talks about when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I did away with all these things. I thought of this stat this morning as a, somewhat of an old stat, so I don't have it perfectly in my head. But Barner Group did a study, and most Christians in their first year, I don't know about you, but when I first became a Christian and I got saved, I was super passionate. had a very, uh, just a zeal for the Lord, risk taker. I didn't care what I said to who I said. It was about being obedient and walking in that love. I was a baby. I was a Christian. I did, that's just what I did. And that's what most Christians do. And in this study by Barna, it shows that people, after their first year, they stop sharing the gospel with other people. So when they're at, at their most infancy, most childlike state in their faith, they're willing to reach out to one another. They're willing to have this zeal, this passion, and tell everybody about Jesus and their testimony. But instead of maturing, and walking more in that love, they become apathetic. And they stop reaching out. And I think many of us know what that feel, feels like. That we forget our first love. We forget what maybe necessary God did in our life and that passion and that zeal that we had for Him. And about ministering and telling the world about Him. At the church I grew up with, there was a, I ain't going to say his name, but there was a guy that, man, just was always, every time you see him, just so passionate. When he worshiped, I'm talking about, like, he worshiped. He brought the house down. He was, everywhere that he went, he was telling people about Jesus. And he didn't care what needed to be done. He, he was there serving. 
and, it, and, and made sure that it was done. It didn't matter how dirty the job was, how hard the job was, how thankless the job was. It didn't matter if it was being, about being seen or not seen. That it was going to get done because he just had that heart. And it's sad to look now in his life and it's nothing like that. It's sad because I look now that he's became apathetic. That he's gone through things that hurt, but, but he's became apathetic and he went from this infant stage so passionate about God and I remember when I would be at church and he was there and there wasn't many people in the building other than the staff and and he would be cleaning a toilet see it's more than just about cleaning a toilet he you could hear him across the church praying I can't remember what he was praying but now if I, if I had to say it's probably as people encounter this throne, they would encounter your throne. Um, you know, but everything he did was out of that zeal, was out of that passion, that he allowed that, that his, his passion that he felt through his relationship with God to compel him to go. Compelled him to go. I, if I can just be really frank for this last uh, moment here. As a student pastor, it's more than just my job to do what I do. I don't do this because it's a position, because it's something I get told to do. But this is what obviously God's called me to. My position is more than just about finding people who are volunteer to to hold Ezra in the nursery. It's more than just find somebody that would teach elementary. It's more than having people to be leaders in our youth ministry. It's so much more than that. I'm not looking for people just to be bodies, to be a warm body in a space. But I want people who have a heart of the king that's willing to serve with that heart. Because there's a generation, there's people that walk in this building that need so much more. They need so much more than just a performance, than just a good service, than somebody greeting them at the door. But they need a people that are willing to be compelled by love. And it ends that with 1 Corinthians 13. It says that this love is unselfish love for others growing out of God's love for me. That this love that you feel that compels you to reach to others, that goes over your fear, goes over your boundaries, that you start to have a conversation and do things that you never thought you could do, it's because of your relationship with the king. You start to line your heart with the rhythms of his heart. We don't need people serving. I don't need to be minister. I don't need to be leading out of selfish gain. I don't need the rhythms of my life to walk with what I think is success. I don't need the rhythms of my life to build up my own kingdoms, my own ministry, and then it be about me and my family. But I need the rhythms of my life to line up with the king, and with his heart. That we need to carry the heartbeat of heaven in everything that we do. Just like Jesus. When he went through the hardest moment of his life here on earth, and he asked for the cup to pass pass him. The reason why he was able to receive the wrath of God on the cross is because love says go. I love that the Bible describes God as the Alpha and the Omega, that he's the beginning and the end, that he's the one that saw the end from the beginning. It says that Christ was crucified from the foundations of the earth. Before you were ever born, before you ever took your first breath, and even before you take your last, he knew that you needed a Savior. And he was crucified from the foundations of the earth. And he knew that when he was in the garden, he was praying. When all of his friends had fallen asleep, when he needed help the most, when he needed a community the most to love and support him through this difficult task, he was able to receive that wrath. He was able to take up the cross because love says, go. And in the middle of the beating, in the middle that Jesus took the crown of thorns so that we could have good thoughts, so that we could have a peaceful mind. In the middle of that, he was thinking of your troubles, of your heartaches, of the situations that you would be in. 
because he was filled with that compassion as he took the crown of thorns. As he took the straps on the back, they were peeling back his skin. They were peeling back his muscle that most man would not have lived through. He was able to go through that because of that compassion for you. Because he was like, I'm taking each strap because I know that, that Brittany is dealing with cancer. That I know that this guy's dealing with back pain. I'm taking each and every one for all of their heartaches, for all of their issues, for all of their pain. So that their body can walk in healing. And he took up the cross. One of the most painful devices of torture of any human that they could ever feel. That the Romans had devised this cross perfectly to endure as much pain as they could. That they were just suffering. And our Savior took that. Our shameless Lamb of God took that so the sons of man could be, I'm sorry, so the sons of man could be the sons of God. It's because he was walking with that compassion that was compelling him to the cross to take every, every drop of blood that came down that cross was because of you. It was because of the compassion he felt for you. Then he rose victorious because of that same compassion. Because he knew that you needed to live in victory. And one day have that hope for a future eternal glory with him. Because love says go. If you will, everybody, up on your feet. Love says go. And maybe in this moment, in these last few moments, God has been doing something in you. Maybe he's stirring your heart. And he's convicting your heart. And you don't know him, but you came in this place looking for that hope, looking for that love, because you realize I can't do this on my own, that I need a Savior. These addictions, these habits, this yoke, this bondage that I'm carrying, I can't break it off. That's the point. We needed a cross. We needed a Savior. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if that's you this morning, the Bible just says we simply have to ask and believe and that we will be saved. And if that's you in this house this morning, you feel God compelling you to make him Lord and Savior of your life. And maybe you've tried this once, but you're living life in all of the wrong places and doing all the wrong things. And you need to come back to him and truly make him Lord of all. We're going to say a prayer together because all we have to do is confess, ask, and believe, and we become Lord and Savior of our life. So let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the cross. I thank you that you sent your Son as my replacement on that cross. I believe that he died for my sins, for my failures. God, and I believe that he rose again from that grave. God, I pray that you would be Lord of my life, that you would become my Savior. God, that you would wash me as white as wool. God, I thank you for this fresh start. I thank you for this new beginning. I pray that you would order my steps, and God, that you would lead and guide me. God, and that you would help me out of my habits and my hangups. God, that today, that I'm no longer that old man, but that you have made me brand new. God, and I thank you for this new heart that you put in me. God, help this heart to lead into your heart and lead into love. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. If you said that this morning, welcome to the family of God.